Hello and welcome. He travels to remote regions across the world and waits patiently over years to get the right shot. But once he takes a picture, it's guaranteed to be unique. And his images have changed the way we, as humans, relate to the animal kingdom. This week on 101, meet the remarkable photographer, filmmaker and animal advocate, Gregory Colbert. Nowadays, the Canadian-born creative talent shrugs off labels such as artist or photographer as his work has reached a level of depth and complexity that encompasses more than just a picture, film or piece of art. Gregory Colbert started out with more conventional work, but after his first exhibition in 1992 in Switzerland, he decided to launch a series of expeditions across the world, lasting the next decade. The result was a remarkable documentation of diverse wildlife interacting with humans in their natural setting. His unique exhibition, Ashes and Snow, was presented in 2002 to international acclaim and launched what's become something of a movement to protect wildlife through awareness. Colbert sees the unique relationship in his images as a way to highlight how mankind should respect the creatures around them. Gregory Colbert, what a, what a pleasure to speak with you. Pleasure to be here. Now, looking at your philosophy in life, you say, I don't wear watches so I can work outside time. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? Well, I, I, I work with elephants or whales or mantas and, and they don't wear watches, so, they, so you have to work on a, a manta time or a cheetah time. So I don't try to impose my cadences on other species. And if you're in the desert uh, in, uh, with a Bedouin or if you're in, uh, with a Bushman, I think that uh, uh, watches have very limited use. So it's not that I, I'm against a linear use of time, but for, for my work it would be antithetical. Where time does come into your work, though, is that you, unlike many uh, artists, work across a long period of time. You plan ahead, and, and yours is actually a very considered and very patient kind of approach to sure. the work. So when you look at how your work has evolved over the years you've been doing it, you know, two decades or so, how, how has it changed? Uh, first of all, I, I, I'm often, because we always want to put us in boxes and labels, what, this is what, I do this, or this, uh, they use the word artist, and I always think of art, A, capital A, artist. I, I, I really would define what I do as a storyteller. And so I've been telling stories for two decades. I would say that, yes, I've, I've, I've been doing that. Uh, what's interesting is to, to have an expression in an orchestra. And I'm just one musician in the orchestra, and I'm not trying to be... Uh, we're unfortunately as a species also we're, we've turned into the species that turn our back to the orchestra and then when we look at the human orchestra we said well actually this is what the human, we, we actually compressed this into this monoculture so I'm, I'm all about opening up the orchestra not just to other animals but to other species. Does your, your love of nature come from your origins? You were born in Toronto in Canada and Canadians are known to love the outdoor life generally. Sure, sure. I think any it, we're all born. We, we have a, a capacity for wonder and, and unfortunately by a certain age we tend to be uh, that can be broken or, but mine clearly is, has an atrophied as I've grown older. It's actually increased exponentially because I'm conscious more and more that it's passing. So, and yes, I'm born in Canada, and there's there's a, there's nature there, but there's nature if you're in the Gobi or if you're in Antarctica, but even if you can go into Central Park here in New York City. But unfortunately, this, the the way we teach kids is they is as as I was saying before is to turn their back to nature, and all mine work is all about them to 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 gaze back at nature. So, how did your parents teach you? What how, what was your relationship like with them? How did they influence you? I did my first master classes, yes, I would say, with nature with, with them, and, and uh, I, I had, I would consider, I have a very undistinguished education, uh, scholastically speaking, so bad education can teach you to, to teach yourself. So uh, I went to the library, and, and I was as interested in, in the book library as the living library, so I would go to the library, and then I'd go out into nature, and uh, there was nothing about the kind of work I was trying to do other than the work of scientists that were actually in the field. As a youngster, though, how, do you, how were you influenced by... What did your parents, for example, encourage you to do? Uh, <laughs> I guess they tried to encourage me to go to school. <laughs> but but I was looking out the window most of the time, <laughs> planning to... To, to, <laughs> to escape. <laughs> to escape, exactly. Did they have any... I, was, uh, I wanted to join the circus or to be an explorer or something. Did they have any ideas, though, on what you should be? Did they encourage you in any particular field or profession? Uh, I, I think that... Uh, uh, I, I, I have a son, so, but 
from a genetic point, I, I think it, it's, I, we, we are, uh, uh, the, uh, what's that word, uh, nurturing. We're, we're, the, we're the product of the nur nur nurturing of our parents. But I had a very clear idea from a very young age that a that, uh, path that I wanted to take. And, and, uh, and I think I've been doing what I've been doing since I was three or four. So I don't know that I was taught. I just think I just kept doing what I, what I was drawn to and, and, and amazed by and loved. Can you remember the first time you picked up a camera? The first time, well, a camera is just an instrument. Uh, it's it's uh, it's it's it's, a, it's not it's not about to me about a something that you press a button and it takes a, an image in a hundredth of a second. Like, and again, I'm not a photographer, and I, I I was thinking in terms of documenting. You would do you aware of the first time you had something that said you could document what you see? I would say I would be drawing. I was drawing, and then other points I was I was taking a camera, and then other points I'd be writing, and then I was using my building blocks and. And it's it's about the, the, a lot of photography. It's it's not it, it, it's you take a photo and I'm I'm making images and I I see a lot of uh, um, what I love about cinema or, or these uh, some of these other other mediums is, is it's like walking into somebody's universe and the universe that I I I, I don't want to take I don't uh, you know I, I don't take you don't take a painting you don't take a piece of music you you make so my work is collaborative so as Again, labels and definitions, I wouldn't also define myself as a photographer. I, I'm a storyteller who uses photography and or architecture or film, but at, first and foremost, I'd, I'm a, I'd, I try to tell stories. Now, early on, when you were setting up on a more conventional path, I guess, you, you started out quite young, 23, 24, you, you went up to Paris. That I haven't taken a conventional path? <laughs> no, well, well, of course, now you're doing unique, very unique work. But when, when you started out, I think 23, 24, you went up to Paris, yeah. and you were doing uh, documentaries about sure. social issues. Yes. What were the social issues that really resonated with you at that time? I, I was working, uh, I, I several, several issues. I worked on rape, I worked on AIDS, I worked on the terminally ill, and uh, I, I, I love making documentaries, and I, what I've loved about the subjects that I was working on is the people didn't have time for artifice. And when we're in crisis, we tend to be, to reveal our authentic selves. Uh, we have a series of masks that we have to we tend to develop in our day-to-day -day life and those masks seems to f so seem to fall away when did you discover you could use uh, say f for example photography as a medium that could express what you wanted to I mean to, to have this voice as you say or to draw on that particular palette where with the switch from moving imagery uh, to and I know you still use both sure sure uh, I, I don't know that it's a conscious choice I always had uh, it's it's a t part of a toolbox um, and Still cameras are one thing in the toolbox, and, and the, the, a pen is another, and a moving camera is another. Anthropology, even it's just the, these, this is, this is the most important, or these are the most part, important parts of my toolbox. Even when I talk about an orchestral way of what, what nature is an orchestra, even as an, as an expression of storytelling, is that it, it's kind of symphonic. So maybe there's, this tool is more appropriate at this time uh, than another, but I, I wish I had, 10 lifetimes because there's so many other tools that I'd like to put include in this toolbox. But how, how did your family regard your, your move into this work? How, how does your family regard what you have done? I, I, to, to my credit and to anyone who has a child that, that uh, uh, perhaps has these crazy dreams, is they, I, I guess if they, don't, they didn't break my spirit. And uh, could they relate to your? Because you they had no idea what I was doing. They didn't have any idea what I was doing. They came to the opening of Venice of Ashes and Snow, and I remember the Tetsuya Chikuchi, a wonderful, wonderful man, and he did the nightly news, and then he did a show as as you do, and he did this wonderful interview, which I was surprised by, with my parents, and he did ask them, "Did you understand what he was doing?" And they said, "Oh, we had no idea what he was doing." <laughs> And, I, and I, did, I didn't really think about it that much, but we thought it was going to work out okay. How do you regard what, uh, what you know, I, I would call commercialism? I think you should call it commodification of sure. art. I, I am horrified. Uh, I don't see art, the arts as real estate. I think it's something that should be irrelevant. I think it's something that should open people up or can open people up. That they can use the hairs on the back of their neck. They can they have a job in the day and they can only use a small part of their heart. And so they want to go to the movies or they want to see an exhibition or something that opens them up. Um, I didn't grow up wanting to make objects for wealthy people. Uh, I happen to be been clearly quite successful in in different ways, and, and there's a recognition of value that is h h huge for my work. But the value is, a point of 
if I were to measure from 1 to 100, is irrelevant if I wasn't creating exhi exhibitions that were for everyone. And we are creating these institutions and museums around the world that follow a model that reinforce the value of, of these objects and are not about sharing in a democratic way the experience to everyone. Everyone, and, and you know, very few people will ever be collectors. Why would I only make an, an experience for those people? Um, Mozart didn't make uh, uh, music that was supposed to live in, in, in between the walls of, 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 of a wealthy person's room. It was to, to be out there and live in the world. And so I, that's why there is the Nomadic Museum and that's why the work, it's not about reinforcing those values. And I think that uh, um, sadly, other cultures are following this model. And it, 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 it's, it, it really breaks my heart, really breaks my heart. I want to talk about some of the unique work you've done in more detail in just a moment. We're going to take a short break here. More with Gregory Colbert when we come back. Welcome back. You're watching One on One. We're speaking with award-winning photographer and filmmaker Gregory Colbert. In the 1990s, early 1990s, you decided to stop exhibiting and, and just basically plan a long series of expeditions. This is the, the foundations of your work, actually. Where did that idea come from? What made you say, okay, let's put this, this you know, ex exhibiting aside and, this, and, and plan these expeditions? If you become successful in your work, which is, it's wonderful and it's nice, and, and I would be the last person to say it's not wonderful to have appreciation. And, you, and that gives you also the freedom to do your work. Success also takes away your solitude. And you need, this work that I need uh, to do is, is, a lot of it is solitary, and it's, I love people, I love, I love uh, uh, my family, and my friends, but I need to go out. And I think that there's, we live in a time that creates cults of personalities, and there is, um, I don't have any social aspirations. I don't, the, I, I, I wanted to, to go out and be in the field. And there's a saying, the celebrity, well, that's actually given your profession. I'm sure you're, you're, <laughs> you, you've done a master class on this. Celebrity is a mask that eats your face. And I, I, what I love about working with an elephant is he doesn't give a hoot, shall we say, <laughs> about what you've accomplished or what recognition you've had. If you bore an elephant or if you bore an el a whale, they'll yawn, they'll, it's just like with a, a child or, or and, and I wanted to just arrive without my medals or this or that and, and, and just continue this collaboration. And I just felt, I, I thought the, the, the best, uh, climate to work in is silence, and so I chose silence. The images, I, I mean, they, they really look so unique. A lot of people are going to say, surely this can't be, this didn't happen. You did not have a woman lying on a mantle. You didn't have someone bowing next to an elephant like this or face to face with a, a cheetah. Well, I, we're, 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 cynic, we're cynical, uh, as, uh, we've become somewhat cynical, and I think that we, uh, uh, I, uh, th thank you so much for the credit to be given if people think I was able to invent this, uh, these expressions out of my own human pea brain because actually these voices, are, they exist, they're resonant, they're powerful, they're full of, uh, you know, there's whale hearts, there's panda hearts, there's human hearts, it, it's their expression and I, and I can't regenerate that out of a computer generated effect. How do you know when the shot is right because some of these just, uh, how do you know? I was blown away. I mean, when you can't speak, laughter, absolute joy. Uh, and the, what a great thing to work in a creative expression that is collaborative, because there's other people that work with me, and we, j we, j we can't speak, we just laugh. Ashes to Snow wasn't originally a nomadic show, was it? It was originally something you exhibited it, and then was bought up and gave you the idea. Was it when the Rolex chairman decided yeah, yeah. to buy up all the pieces? It, it, it was. The Nomadic Museum actually predates the exhibition in, 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 in Venice, and that's actually what I wanted to do. I was very... Um, I had done exhibitions in museums, and, I, and, I, and this sterile white cube did not make my heart sing. And I said, isn't there another way? And the more I looked at it, and the more I look at these museums, it's, it's the way that we experienced and wanted to... to 
to look at the, 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 the fine arts for several hundred years. For me, it's over, it's finished. These are dinosaurs. They're, they're, it's, they're Jurassic buildings with their legs in the tar pits. We want to have spaces that are reactive and agile. We don't, and, and frankly, if you do it, and exhibitions are often booked six, seven years in advance. How can you be agile? And they're run by, it, um, <laughs> but let's say, would you put ac is the idea of academics to, uh, to, to, to create films and to create or a, a publishing house or to create a dance. You, no, I, 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 we should have our ears to the sidewalk and the sidewalk tells us that, uh, it, it, that everybody's welcome and what, what, that the arts are inclusive and these buildings and institutions are not. Shiguruban is the Japanese architect you approached to, to create this. Initially, yes, yes, yeah, yeah. And, and you said you wanted to create a 21st century cathedral. Yes, for nature. For nature, it's yes. amazing. Now, it's been the most visited traveling museum, isn't it? Is it more, how many millions, ten, more than 10 million people o already? Over 10 million, yeah, yes, yes. Amazing. It's not, if you would, please don't, I, I'd never imagined that, it's, it's, it's a wonderful to live in your time, I never imagined that sociological shift would take has, would have taken place so clearly. So that's not just cultural; that's sociological. I think that there's a hunger in megacities. People feel isolated from nature. Do they really want to go see a bunch of stuffed dead animals in a diorama with glass eyeballs uh, and say to a kid, "Well, that's that's the song of a whale." No, that's a big stuffed animal, uh, mammal. And I think we want to create spaces in, from the, that create a bridge between also the arts and nature. And that's what I've tried to do with the Nomadic Museum. It's also interesting that beyond the beauty of the animals, you have some amazing animals obviously in the shots, you choose quite unique people. I mean, they really are truly globally representative of, of the human species. Thank you for saying globally representative. Yes, I've, I've been criticized, you know, there was, there was one comment that was made to me that, why was I only, it was here in New York, the only white person that was in, uh, literally, and there was all these exotics, and, and they literally referred to other people as exotics. And they, this woman referred to a, a photo, famous photograph of Avedon that, uh, that somehow the work would be reminiscent of, it's called uh, Davima and the Elephants. And I looked at her and I said, did you, did you say exotics? And I said, I said, well, if I go to India or if I go to, to, to Namibia, or, I work the people that are there, the indigenous people. And I said, if you want to go see uh, white people's faces in the story of, of the narrative of white people, go to the MoMA and go to the Metropolitan Museum. That's the story will be told. But that's only a small part of the story. And this is not about the supremacy of the white Western canon. And in the case of the Ashes and Snow or the work that I'm doing, I think that uh, uh, we, we have created a very pyramidal uh, model for, for, for culture, and I don't adhere to that, so I, yes, I've, these people that I work with, they are um, very much, uh, they're as much as the animals, they, 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 are, they are rooted in their cultures, and I don't want to project, I mean, bring a bunch of people from New York or whatever, uh, to, to, to be in these stories. It's not their story. You say you let animals tell their stories in their own voices. Sure. Considering what we've done to this planet, what are they saying? Uh, they're saying, uh, what would the, if, I, I, again, I, I don't want to, I wish the elephants and the whales were here to, to, <laughs> to, 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 to yeah. if, if I, I think, cause the, the, if, I, if I were to consider myself a kind of an ambassador, I, I would say that they hope that we're the generation that decides to preserve the orchestra. And they want to, they've been here for millions of years, and they would like, uh, uh, for us to be inspired enough because we're the one generation and that when they come and see Ashes and Snow and, and to see the, the, the future parts, we cannot say that we didn't know what that music was. In, and we can perhaps, our parents were not as knowledgeable, but fortunately we have media and we're gonna show you what that music is. And, and it's, if, if you're gonna burn that orchestra, you're gonna burn knowing what the music is and we'll, I will show you. You work quite uniquely in that you don't have a dealer, you don't have a gallery, it's, it's very much out there in the world. Um, and I wonder, when, when you look at, but you do have, actually, you do have some uh, fairly high profile collectors, don't sure, you? People sure. come to you. P uh, Donna Karen, I think, was one. And um, I guess, presumably, you, the, building the profile will help uh, get that message out there, get your message out there, being among the, the sort of the glitterati as well. I hope, I hope it was never glitterati. I, I, I actually think that I'll give credit to people. Um, is I've had, even with the case of uh, certain individuals, one who was the wealthiest man in the world when we presented the last exhibition, was helped, helped uh, uh, it was uh, Carlos Slim. The mistake people have made in the arts is it's been very elitist. 
and uh, the glitterati is relevant to the other glitterati. But the people um, that can participate in a project like this and are interested um, all have a vote and they elect governments and they have families and they're raising their children and I'm trying to affect those people and I certainly, I, I, as I said earlier, I don't have any social aspirations. You'll never see photos of me and and or or what I, I, I don't have time I'd, to sit on a velvet cushion. I'd rather be out in the field. I can see your passion for this and we can hear it actually and uh, I know you get so much out of being there and, sure. and doing all this. Is there a price to pay for what you do? Is there a personal price to pay in any way? Of course. Of course. I don't have I don't have ten lifetimes. If you if you go off you you have to say hello and you have to say goodbye and that's part of the process. Um, and I, I, I guess the people that, that are close to me understand that process, or I try to explain the best I can. Um, and that's an ongoing process. <laughs> and I'm sure it will continue <laughs> to be all through my life. Um, but I think we just have to be who, uh, that, that be who we are. And I can't seem to be or pretend to be. And I would have thought maybe with time, I, it would get maybe a little, I guess, I would become a little bit less nomadic, but it's actually, it, it's, it, way, it goes the other way. I realize that that's what I know how to do, and if I had to justify my existence, the people that will love me will, will love me uh, because I was, I was being who, who I was with all my frailties and qualities. What would you like your legacy to be? How would you like to be remembered? Uh, I don't, I personally, I, 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 I'd be happy to be remembered by those that I love, but I would, the, it's, it's not me personally, it's, I think it's the work that I'm, uh, that I'm doing and um, I will be measured uh, by how much I love the elephants, how much I love the whales, how much I love the, the mantra, all, the, all, the, all the, my collaborators and all the human collaborators that I work with because I think it's, I've often said, it's, it's B Billy Wilder, he was asked, how did you not fall in love with Marilyn Monroe when you were making that film? And he said, of course I fell in love with her. Uh, but that's the job of the director of the storyteller. But you fall in love with her through the lens of the camera. So uh, I'm, I, I'm always, I mean, uh, I may be in love with penguins for a period of time, and then I fall in love with a, a manta rays, and then I'm back with the humpbacks. Uh, so I'll be measured, how much did I love nature? That's how I'll be, that, that, that's maybe that would be how much I would be remembered. Well, Gregory Colbert, I wish you a long life with lots more storytelling. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank, Thank you for having me.